My name is Thomas Rickert. I'm a lawyer from Bonn, Germany. I have a law firm with 10 lawyers and we're specializing in everything legal surrounding the digital economy. And today I'm here because I've been working with the Eco Association for more than 25 years now. That's when you realize that you're getting really old. Um, and I'm chairing what we call the Names and Numbers Forum. And that's the part of the Eco Association uh, where registries, registrars and resellers live. And I'm trying to take good care of their interests together with the colleagues at, at ECO. Those who haven't heard uh, of ECO, it's an association with more than a thousand <coughs> members from more than 60 countries. It runs the DKIX, which is sort of the equivalent to, to M6 uh, that you have here in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, and we also have members from the domain industry that manage more than 70% of all domain names worldwide. Who of you was forced or voluntarily dealt with NIS2 already? Anyone? Did you look into NIS2 already? A little bit? A little bit? Okay, so if I don't know any further, I'm going to lean on you and ask you to help me out. Now, um, NIS2 is a cybersecurity law, and it's a directive, so other than the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, this needs to be transposed into national law. You know, so general rule is regulations are immediately applicable, directives need to be transposed. And this is currently in the process of being transposed. And you need to check, because the um, NIS2 suggests that there was NIS1, <laughs> which there is, but NIS1 was not that broadly applicable. Right, so there are many more companies that fall under NIS2 than did under NIS1. So I'm going to cover just a little bit of what's likely of interest for this, for this audience. But you need to check whether you are active in one of the areas that fall under NIS, NIS2. And also if you meet the thresholds in terms of size so that you fall under, under this uh, regime. Right? So do check that. Uh, but what we can say for sure is that TLD name registries, such as SIDN, Verizon, and others, fall under NIS2 in its entirety, as well as DNS service providers. So regardless of their size, these are in. If you are a registrar, or a reseller, or a privacy and proxy service provider, all those are covered under the definition of entities providing domain name registration services, then you only need to look into two areas. One is Article 28, and that's going to absorb most of the time that we spent together today. And you might also need to look into, is it on this or on the next slide, uh, on supply, ch supply ch chain issues, because a registry would be your supplier if you are a registrar. You know, so that's something that you would need to uh, take a look into. Now, at the moment, the transposition is underway. The deadline for that is October 16th, so on October 17th, everything needs to be ready for prime time. I can tell you now that likely most of the European member states are not going to meet that deadline. You know, so we just see the first couple of drafts uh, emerging at the moment, but um, you know, so it, it will not be ready for most of, most of the countries. And that has some serious implications because you, as I think most of you are re registrars, you need to build something to support this. You need to change your processes to support this. And you will have virtually no warm-up time for that. And that's going to be a challenge. So what you need to rely on and hope, hopes and prayers, is that the authorities can't require the impossible of you. So come October 17th and you're not ready, you can tell them, you know, this is something that we couldn't implement overnight because we don't yet know what the Dutch lawmaker really wants from us. You know, I think the, the ministries are going to publish something next Tuesday in, in the Netherlands that you should watch out for. But, you know, it's likely not going to be a full law in, in, in October. So, if you, is anyone of you representing companies that are not based in the EU? Well, that's good, but uh, for this is sort of the, the global reach part of, of NIS2. This is what the European lawmakers love to do. They require a representative in the EU 
whenever a controller or processor, or in this case, some uh, uh, a company falling under NIS2, uh, is not based in the EU. And then only that jurisdiction where the re representative is based is applicable. You know, so that's something that you need to tell your friends from outside the EU. Now let's start with a little bit of old and new news, depending on how deep you are in this. But uh, I mentioned we have NIS2, we have the transposition that's underway, and there is a cooperation group with members from the European member states where they sit together and talk about how they can assist the national lawmakers in implementing NIS2. And there are two things that are particularly tricky, and we'll talk about that more. So this is sort of just a little teaser. They have uh, installed a task force on verification of registration data, how that shall be performed. And they have one task force dealing with the question of legitimate access seekers. I'm not going to tell you now what that means, just to make you a little bit uh, interested and keep up the energy. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the important takeaway for you now that we're discussing the procedural aspects is that these task forces will only provide their feedback to the plenary of the cooperation group late summer. So it's not, not going to be any time soon. Which means that if it goes to the plenary late summer, it's highly unlikely that the cooperation group will produce something in time for the national lawmakers to, uh, to take, it, take into consideration when they're drafting their laws. You know, so I've been told by one of, the, one of the member state representatives that they are just considering that for secondary law, that they might push out after the fact, right? Now, we've seen uh, drafts in the Czech Republic, in Austria, Germany, and Belgium. And Belgium is actually the most interesting one. And I've tried this with, with the group when I, when I did the, uh, my presentation like an hour ago. You tell me when we come to the question of legitimate access seekers, you scream Belgium, and then I will tell you a funny story about that. And don't forget. Now, the good news is that after we've been afraid that there would be fragmentation all over Europe with all the lawmakers doing their different things and requiring different things from you, what we see at the moment is what we've begged them to do, and that is not to go beyond what Article 28 requires, right? To keep it as agnostic to approach technology approaches and stuff like that, to make it easier for the industry to come up with, with responses. And, and that is likely going to be true. Also, it's unlikely that we're going to get something that really helps on the, on the tricky questions. There, we, we, see, we see that there are some uh, laws that, that give a little bit of, of assistance in how to do things, you know, but it's likely not going to be much. So the other thing that you need to bear in mind in this context is that ICANN has recently published a new registration data policy. Anyone aware of that? Uh, well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not surprised that Martin, is, Martin is, is a board member of ICANN and Rolf is following this very closely as well. But it's important to know this because you are likely also selling GTLD domain names, right? And what we did with the registration data policy, and I said we did because I've been part of the group that's been working on that, after the GDPR kicked in, the ICANN board issued what we called a temporary specification, which is an urgency policy. That's something that the ICANN board can do in order to reflect the, the requirements of GDPR because ICANN was scared that after having illegally published registration data for decades that they would get sanctioned by the, by the authorities in Europe. So they came up with this temporary specification, but since the board did, that by, did it by itself and there was no community involvement, the, the bylaws require ICANN to then start an expedited policy development process to review the temporary specification through its multi-stakeholder model. And this expedited process took like four years or something, you know, so that's fast in the ICANN, ICANN world. But we did a couple of things. One is we killed the admin C. We killed the billing C because we said that this is not working with the principle of data minimization. Also, we allowed for registrars just to send a minimum data set to the registry. 
We see that working quite nicely with .com, which has a thin registry, as you know. The registrar knows who the registrant is, but the registry doesn't. The registry knows with which registrar the data is, but they don't know the identity of the end customer, right? So don't confuse thin registries with the minimum data set, because it's not the same thing, but it's sort of a comparable approach, right? So we made possible that it's, that, that, this, that it's an option for registries who have no interest in getting the data from the registrants to actually go pretty thin in terms of what, what data they want. Because with every piece of data that you get goes along additional risk of vulnerability and uh, legal responsibility. We'll get back to that in a moment. So Article 28, basically, and, and you're going to get these slides, so I'm not going to read that to you, but you can read that later. If you can't sleep, you go through that slides, and I'm, I'm sure that you're going to sleep like a baby afterwards. You need to maintain a database of accurate registration data. That's one. Then you need to, uh, what's that? Um, um, we should actually be looking at that. This is the subsection that talks about what data elements need to be collected. Domain name, date of registration, registrant's name, contact, email address, and phone number. We've removed the phone number from the ICANN world before because that wasn't really necessary. So they want the phone number. Contact, email address, and phone number of the point of contact administering the domain name in the event that they are different from those of the registrant. You might remember we killed the admin C. So did DNIC, for example, as well, because they said we, d we don't really need it. Now, for those who believe in the Bible, this is the Lazarus moment of the admin C. It has its moment of resurrection. So you might need that additional data point again. And that basically, uh, it was great for the intellectual property folks who want as much data in as many places as possible, because they said we now need to unwrap the registration data policy and reinstall the requirement to collect the data for the admin C, for example. And if somebody tells you that's bullshit, because the, excuse my French, but because the registration data policy allows you to collect additional data, mens, data elements, if you need that, them, for example, if you are, have special eligibility requirements, you can collect additional data elements, or if you're so required under your applicable laws. Then you need to verify the data. You know, the data needs to be accurate. And in the recitals, it, say, it specifies that it's, it's sufficient to verify one data element, which makes the players in the GTLD world believe that what they're forced to do under the RIA 2013, i.e. validating either phone number or email address, would be sufficient. But we've been told by lawmakers at the European level that they don't think that's sufficient. So they also need, need to move. And you need to publish the policies and procedures on how you do the verification, verification validation, right? So that's something that's going to be tricky because there's nothing in the law that uh, makes a distinction between new and old registrations. There is no grace period for you to warm up with uh, the national transposition, which means that on the 17th of October, you need to have um, checked all that registration data for potentially, you know, if it, with your registrar, it can be anything from a, from a couple of thousand to, you know, like in your case, a couple of million data sets. So how to do that? Is AIDAS required in order to, to do that? The Czech folks wanted to do that, but even their AIDAS laws don't allow them to use the AIDAS model, you know? So it, there are some complexities involved in that. You can't possibly do that overnight. So what you need to do, and this is something that the, that the registries are discussing quite a bit, is, is you know, focus on new registrations first, and then for the old ones, apply some uh, algorithms to see which names are likely prone to posing a risk. You know, so if you have your name like for 30 years and you just forgot to tell uh, the registry that you moved, that's something different than a, a typo squatted name of a brand which is likely going to, to be used for, for a phishing campaign. Right? So we don't yet know, but that's something that's, that's being discussed quite a bit at the moment. Belgium. Belgium, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to Belgium now. And this is the, the Belgium moment. You need to publish registration data unless there's personal data in it. And there's some fun behind this one too, because we do know that Article 28, 
which is sort of the, an outlier in the concept of the cybersecurity law, because suddenly it de deals with registration data, you know, so that's something that the national lawmakers don't really know how to handle. Article 28 came in because the EU wasn't happy with the outcome of the EPDP. They said not enough data must be published, particularly when it comes to legal entities. But we do know that legal entity, entities' names can contain personal data. So my, my law firm is called Richard Rechtsanwaltsgesellschaft. That's my name. That makes it personal data. So they said, you need to publish that data. And for email addresses, they said, you, you must publish those email addresses for the legal entities unless they contain personal data. Now, good luck <laughs> in making that distinction. Because even if you have role contacts uh, in, in your system, role contacts can be, can be personal data as well. So if it's CEO at, and if there's only one CEO, that's directly uh, attributed uh, or attrib attributable uh, to, the, to the individual behind it. You know, and that's sort of something that we couldn't really get a solution for at ICANN. And now NIS2 poses us with the same ambiguity that we had in the ICANN world. You know, but that's fun. So you, you will have the challenge of uh, publishing that data uh, at your earliest convenience, basically. And then you need to disclose data to legitimate access seekers, and that's the, the Belgium part, within 72 hours. The question is, who are legitimate access seekers? Can I call myself a server security analyst tomorrow and ask Roloff to send me data for whoever of you has a .nl domain name? You know, who makes that distinction? And then the, the, the Belgians have been forthcoming enough to put a list of access seekers into their draft law. What do you think, who do you think is number one on that list? Come and throw some names at me. Who, who do you think should have the right to ask for data? Police. Police? The king. <laughs> the king has the right to amend the list. It's a, yeah, which is sort of a, an odd concept for someone like me, not coming from a land that's governed by a monarchy. What's that? Intelligence. Yeah, I think something uh, to that effect is also in there. But number one is intellectual property rights holders. Now, isn't that funny that the intellectual property lobby has been able to squeeze that in? You know, I. Certainly, there is a, an inflection point between intellectual property violations and, and trademark interests, for example, you know. But using this to open the, the, the door for copyright holders, trademark owners, and others, I think is a little bit odd, to say the least. It's true that intellectual property people have more difficulty to get this data than police today. Yeah. So they, they need. At, at least it, it depends on the jurisdiction. In Germany, for example, if you have a trademark vi violation, I can disclose as a registrant, uh, as a registrar. It's it's less cumbersome than for law enforcement, because you know the the mechanics under German law are, as, as, as I think in other jurisdictions, you know, a pro an intellectual property lawyer can't put you in jail, while the police can, you know. So. Uh, yeah, but I think that just the, 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 the thought that IP interests are number one in the list is striking. <laughs> and this one is also interesting because that came in in the very last minute. It basically says you need, national lawmakers need to require registries, registrars, resellers, and privacy and proxy service providers, everyone in the chain, to cooperate to avoid the duplication of collection of data. Now, what does that mean? It can mean that all the tasks, maintaining of the database, validation, public who is, and disclosure, need to be performed by everyone, but that only one of them has to reach out to the customer and get the data, you know, collect the data. Or does it mean that collection is meant not in the, in the literal sense, basically, but that they want to avoid the duplication of efforts? for all these tasks, meaning that as long as somebody in the chain does it, it's good enough, which would make sense looking at the principle of data minimization, for example. 
Now, I thought it would be a good idea to look into the GDPR, what collection means, and then to academic commentary and stuff like that, and also in different language versions. So if you look at the English language version of the GDPR, for those who want to look that up, it's Article 13, which says, if you collect data from the data subject, and then Article 14, which is a clause on if you are not the, the entity obtaining the data, it says, data not obtained from the data subject. So the, the GDPR uses collection for getting the data from the data subject, but obtain if you get it from, from someone else, which could suggest that in our case, collection is actually limited to getting it from the data subject. Well, in the German language version, as well as in the French, if I'm not mistaken, it says erhalten or erheben in both cases which means that whether you get it from the data subject or from an intermediary would both be erhebung of the data, which could support my take on this, that the lawmakers wanted to prevent the duplication of efforts in Article 28. But we don't know. The intellectual property folks say, then who is this dead? Because everyone needs to hold that data. But even if you don't hold that data physically, the question is, I'm going to jump back in a moment, whether, let's say, a registrar that does the verification of the data, does it on its own behalf or on its behalf as well as on, the, on behalf of the registry? That, is, that might sound the same, but it's, there are huge legal implications going along with that. If they are just doing it for themselves, that could be the case if Article 28, subsection 6 means that as long as you have an agreement in place, if one does it, the other, others are off the hook, which I think would make sense. But if it means that you can just have a schedule of responsibilities where one does it, but the one entity that, let's say, the, the registrar is doing it, it does it on behalf of the registry, then the registry would still be responsible and the registrar would be the processor likely for the registry, which means that the registry would be responsible for data that they never had, that they never wanted, and the registrar would have an additional liability vis-a-vis -vis the registry because they would be doing it for them, so there would, would be an obligation going along with that. And this is something that I think has never been discussed in any of the fora that I attended on NIS2. I think that the right way to approach this is to, to craft agreements whereby you say, registrar does it, for example. In, in the GTLD world, I think it's highly likely the registry will say, the registrar is the customer contact, I'm going to the new minimum data set anyway, I don't want the data, I don't want to be responsible for it, the registrar needs to do everything. And then they will likely also say that the registrar can't delegate all these tasks to resellers because then it's going to be a mess in the reseller chains that are sometimes a couple of hops long, you know, then things get, get lost. But that, there's a risk going along with that. You know, and I think that you know, if we should probably, or we would be well off if there were, if there were an industry-wide approach that everyone does it the same. Right? But let's talk a little bit about who shall perform the tasks. So we need some sort of arrangement between the registries and the registrars. And I think that uh, SIDN is giving guidance to the registrars in terms of how to verify and validate. So, and, and their model is different from GTLD models. So you will see some CCTLD registries in particular who will say the registrar is performing some of the verification on behalf of the registry because the registry shall be the ultimate repository of accurate data. In the GTLD world, it's likely that you are going to be tasked with doing everything and the registry doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Unless it's, for example, .bank or some other TLDs with uh, harsh eligibility requirements. Then extraterritoriality, because I, um, I'm, I'm getting asked the question quite a bit how this can be gamed and what law is applicable for, for whom. I mean, with SIDN and you being the Netherlands-based registrars, it's pretty simple because SIDN is falling under NIS2, you are falling under NIS2, so both need to play by the rules of NIS2. But the reach of the European lawmakers is not limitless. 
that's not written in the in NIS too, but it's a this is a general principle that the EU, although it might want to do that, to do that, can't rule the world. So on the other end of the spectrum, you have a non-EU registry that doesn't address the European market, and a registrar that let's say only co covers the the Asian market. Then neither of them would fall under NIS two. If you have a registry such as publicinterestregistry.org that serves re registrars in the EU but also other parts of the world, they could make a distinction, two different buckets, one for NIS registrations and one for non-NIS registrations. And then the question is how do the registrars play this? You know, if you have big reseller or, a, or wholesale registrars, they would need to specify which of their group of their customers would fall under NIS2 and which don't. It's pro probable or it's possible that some registries will say we take a one size fits all approach. We put that into our agreements for all our registrars, while others say others might say we are going to take a more nuanced approach and only try to cover what falls under NIS2. Now the the the, the answer is that there needs to be a sufficiently strong link to the European market. What does that mean when it comes to domain name registrations? Let's not forget, this is the cybersecurity law. And if an Asian person registers a domain name and runs a tax on European infrastructure, one could say, well, that's a sufficiently strong link. So other than under the GDPR, where you can take a look at where the data subject is, is sitting, this is not so easy for domain name registrations. So there's, there's a lot of gray area and potentially uh, issues when you accept transfers in, you know, do you revalidate because that, uh, the, the losing registrar might not fall under NIS, so, so you have nothing to lean on. So there are going to be a couple of interesting questions when this is going to be implemented. Now this I covered. Yeah, so my take is that we're going to see more discussion that we're going to see in the GTLD world, registry registrar agreements that point to some other policy that governs what we've just been discussing. Um, likely you you're going to get some homework from your local CCTLD or other CCTLDs uh, whose names you might be selling. And uh, as registrars, you should expect that you will be the ones doing the heavy lifting. You know, the, the level of, of input and support that you get uh, from CCTLDs varies quite a bit. I know that you guys are very active in this in, the, in this area, so are some others. But um, you you can't you you can count on a lot of resources being required at your end to make this happen. Now, on, on that uplifting note, <laughs> all right. Thank you so much.